um, nice sunny hot day in Manlet Island. Um, we'll start off with um, the flag uh, salute. Uh, Pam, would you please lead us? All right, Pam, over your part. Ready again. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you much, um, Madam Secretary. If we could have a roll call. Mr. President, Division Seven, Gary Van Dam. Here. Division Six, Audrey Miller. Here. Division Five, Robert Harris. Here. Division 2, Keith Dias. Here. Division 1, Drew Mercy. Here. Division 3, Frank Donato. Here. Division 4, George Lane. Here. General Manager Knutson. Here. General Counsel Jim Markman. Here. And Holly Hughes present. Yeah, no, thank you. Have a moment. Move on to item number four, voluntary public roll call. We always like to hear from those who may be listening in and that are unable to attend the meeting, and we'd sure like to hear from you. <coughs> John Dino, Palmdale Water District. W welcome. John, you can say mutual group. Hey, hey John, welcome. Hey. Todd Fence, what? White Fence 3, Jack Cephas. Hey, hey, Jack. Hi. Kathy McLaren, Palmdale Water District. Okay, welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If there's no others, you know, thank you very much, and we appreciate it. <coughs> Item number five, public uh, comments. If there's any you know, comments and items that aren't um, further on the agenda, now is the time to, to you know, hear from me. Otherwise, if it comes up on the agenda, everybody's welcome to talk. Okay, moving on to item number six, uh, adoption of agenda. That's um, a board order uh, 6A1, page uh, you know, four. And so I think everybody's had a chance to look at that. In the agenda, a motion would be in order. Mr. President, I'll move on 618. Okay. A motion by Director Miller, or a second by? All second. Director, Director Mercy. Yeah. Okay, thank you much. Uh, Madam Secretary, if we can have a roll call. Gary Van Dam? Yes. Audrey Mercy? <laughs> Audrey Miller? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Robert Paris? There's something we know about. We've been in Robert Ferris? Here. Mm, yes. Keith Dias? Yes. Drew Mercy? Yes. Frank Donato? Yes. George Lane? Yes, yeah. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, moving on to the next item, it's a special item, under number, item number eight, um, A1, this presentation, we have an update on the Delta Conveyance uh, Project. Oh, okay. Um, just the minutes first, the consent calendar. Consent, excuse me, I missed that. We're moving on to item 7A1, the consent calendar, board order 7A1. And so we need a motion for that. Mr. President, I'll move on 7A1. Motion by Director Miller. Second. This may have a Director Miller, second. second. Gary B. Eat at the punch. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, Madam, Madam Secretary. Gary Van Dam? Yes. Audrey Miller? Yes. Robert Harris? Yes. Keith Dias? Yes. Drew Mercy? Yes. Frank Donato? Yes. George Lane? Yes. Uh, motion carried. Now we'll move on to item 8A1 in um, presentation and update the Delta Conveyance Project. And Matt, we'll turn that over to you. Okay. Thank you, President Lane, and good evening, board members. Um, you may recall back in January of this year, we had a presentation from DWR staff and Delta Conveyance Authority staff on the Delta Conveyance project. And that was right around the time the EIR was certified and finalized for the Delta Conveyance project. So um, they, the same group recently completed the updated cost estimate for the project and also went through a benefit cost analysis on the Delta Conveyance Project, and they are uh, visiting various state water contractors in this area, and we we invited them here this evening to give an update to the board, 
And we, so we have uh, three individuals, two in person uh, and one on, on Zoom. Uh, the two in, individuals here in person, you may remember, is Carrie Buckman with DWR and Graham Bratner, who is the executive director with the Delta Conveyance Design and Construction Authority. Also on the phone, we have Dr. Dave Sending, who is a uh, professor at UC Berkeley that prepared the benefit cost uh, analysis on the project. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carrie to kick off their presentation. Thank you, and thank you, thank you, President Lane and members of the board for having us back. We're really glad to be able to talk to you about this milestone and provide some more information. So before we launch into the main part of the presentation with which Graham and Dr. Sunding will give, I wanted to just give a little bit of an update about this year. When we were here in January, you know, we, we didn't have as much detail as we do about the water year as we, as we do now. So each year for the last three years, we've been doing an estimate of if the Delta Conveyance Project were online, how would it have operated in a given year? And this year, the Delta Conveyance Project would have been incredibly helpful. So uh, you may have heard this year that the State Water Project had some issues around steelhead at the South Delta. Steelhead were congregated in the South Delta and created a lot of additional um, regulatory restrictions on our diversions that we don't usually face. This was an unusual year for us. And if the Delta Conveyance Project had been in place, it, it diverts in a different location in the Delta. It's subject to different requirements and it would not have had the same types of steelhead issues. And we would have been able to have the flexibility to move diversions to the North Delta. If we had been able to do that, we would have captured an additional 941,000 acre feet of water, which is enough water to supply over 9.8 million people for one year or nearly 3.3 million households for one year. Uh, it would have been incredibly important in this kind of wet year where we are currently looking at a 40% state water project allocation. We would have been able to capture and store so much more water for future dry conditions. And additionally, I wanted to highlight this here because we're going to talk later about the benefits of the project. And there are some benefits of the project that aren't fully captured in the analysis because they're sort of flexibility related. This kind of benefit we don't have. We didn't anticipate these conditions. We don't model them because they're atypical. But we know that these kinds of things happen. And having the flexibility to respond to them is really important in addition to what Dr. Sunding is going to talk about in his presentation. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Graham to talk about the cost estimate. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, good evening, directors. Pleasure to be back. So I'm going to talk about the updated cost estimate that we recently prepared. Um, the Bethany Reservoir alignment is the project selected by the department back in December as part of the final EIR selected for further study. Uh, this is a 6,000 cubic foot per second total diversion project. Uh, that's through two new intakes that would be constructed in the North Delta along the main stem of the Sacramento River. Uh, 45 miles of tunnel that would connect those intakes in the North Delta down to the existing infrastructure, the existing state water project infrastructure in the South Delta. So that's the conveyance tunnel to move the water and then a new pumping plant down in the south to lift that water out of the tunnel and discharge it directly into the existing Bethany Reservoir. Uh, Bethany Reservoir is, a, is an existing reservoir. It's, it's a good focal point to, to discharge the water. The existing banks pumping plant from the South Delta discharges into that reservoir. Uh, that's where the California Aqueduct heads south and the South Bay Aqueduct heads over to the Bay Area. So it's a good meeting spot to, to discharge these additional flows. Will we have access to this PowerPoint program? Yes. And you know, yeah. is that something you can send to us? Yeah. Not not now, later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I just want to know how many notes I have to take. Yeah, well, and I'll, I'll say just now, we, we don't always emphasize it. We've also put public-facing documents out recording all of the information associated with the cost estimate, as well as Dr. Sunning's work on the benefit cost analysis. That's also available to the public. We've got QR code links at the end of the presentation. If you're interested, great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so the pumping plant, or sorry, the the cost estimate not only includes the direct construction costs and labor costs associated with the facilities, but also accounts for the acquisition of land, the power supply connections, and consumption associated with construction of the project. Environmental mitigation identified in the EIR has been quantified and included in the estimate as well as community benefits program and a settlement agreement to connect up some existing infrastructure for Contra Costa Water District to the facilities as well. Uh, we've included additionally uh, accounting for uncertainty within the estimate in a couple of ways. We have 
traditional contingency, both within the direct construction costs and, and labor and soft costs. Uh, but we've also included risk treatment costs. So that's where we identify specific issues that we're aware of, uh, are able to, to think at this point, what's it going to take to work down and buy down that risk? What additional actions would we need to take on the design side? Uh, quantify those directly and include them as risk treatment costs above and beyond the specific infrastructure identified in the design. So uh, multiple ways to account for uncertainty within the estimate. Our estimate methodology is uh, what we call a bottoms-up approach. So we think about all the activities that would be required to design and construct the facilities, uh, take into account, build up to uh, all of the labor requirements, equipment, material requirements, work our way up to the estimate, sort of in a bottoms-up approach. Uh, we have multiple reconciliations that we've performed through this process. So internally within the estimating process, approaching it from different ways, uh, one of those being more of a top-down approach, which is kind of traditional for projects in the early stages of development. Uh, that's you know that's typical, and that's how the last estimate was done back in 2020. So we've got both to work with at this point, which really adds a lot of confidence in our opinion in terms of how the estimate was developed, uh, how secure we can feel about the numbers uh, relative to that past estimate in 2020. Uh, it, it classifies as a Class 4 estimate according to AACE. Although there are some as aspects that would still be a class five, and that's particularly the tunnel alignment. There's still a lot of information that's needed to, to move that uh, understanding into a class four estimate. We've assumed design, bid, build, procurement in terms of the schedule and the labor and construction costs. Uh, that's a conservative approach that results in the highest, highest cost, typically compared to potential alternative project deliveries like design build, that sort of thing. So we've, we've assumed design bid build across the, the program for the development of the schedule and the cost estimate. This is the schedule. So not only did we develop the estimate, as I mentioned, we had to think about all the activities that would be required. Uh, we, we cash loaded this schedule and then fed this to the economics team so that they can understand the distribution of costs relative to the distribution of benefits and bring those back to a consistent dollar basis. So uh, we did think through all the steps that would be necessary to, to deliver this project. We've got completion of major permitting at the top by the end of 2026, uh, major design activities in 2027 uh, and beyond. Start of construction would be mid-29. That starts with the power connections, access roads, and other logistical requirements. Uh, the tunnel activities would start first with shaft construction and procurement of the machines. Uh, once those are all mobilized to the site around 2033-34, we would actually start tunnel excavation activities. Uh, the peak of construction activities would occur around 2035. At that point, all four reaches of the tunnel excavation would be under construction, as well as the other major elements of the project, the pumping plant, the intakes, discharge structures, et cetera. Construction would continue through the end of 2042, uh, the remaining items there would then be the restoration of the sites that, that have been disturbed through the construction process, any of the road work that's necessary to restore and return those roads back to, to good condition, uh, as well as system startup and commissioning that's necessary for the system. Uh, full turnover by the end of 44 with system startup as part of the state water project in 2045. Oops, sorry, I don't want to jump ahead. Okay. Um, so this is the updated cost estimate. This is in 2023 real prices. So um, these are uh, update compared to the 2020 estimate, which was back in 2020 dollars. Uh, the, the total updated cost is, is shown at the bottom of the table of 20.12 billion in 2023 dollars. So I mentioned we had a couple of different uh, reconciliation processes, both within the construction costs as well as the, the labor cost, and then a, a, a bigger picture reconciliation back to the 2020 that I'll show you here in just a second on the next slide. Um, the way the costs break out, you can see within the table, about 75% of the costs are associated with the direct construction of the facilities, as well as including the construction contingency. So about 15 billion is associated with direct construction. Uh, the other 25% is associated with all the labor, as well as land cost, mitigation program, construction and, and implementation of the mitigation program. Uh, we've got the power costs accounted for as well as settlement agreements and community benefits program, all accumulating to that other 25% of the total costs. Uh, risk management, I mentioned the about 500 million in risk treatment costs are, are included in those construction costs at the top. You can see the application of contingency within the construction estimate there at the top. 
uh, for the, the labor and other program costs down below. It varies depending on the activity. Anything that's got construction in it, got 30% contingency. Labor is 15. Uh, the, the community benefits program and contra costs are our fixed cost, no contingency included at this point. So this slide compares the updated estimate at 20.12 billion. So that's inside the gold box there uh, with the 2020 cost assessment, which is in the middle column. You can see it totaling at the bottom, 15.9 billion. Uh, so we've done a couple of things uh, in looking at this comparison. First, our bottoms up estimate of soft costs has yielded some benefits, has yielded some reduction. So when we worked our way up to those estimates and then calculated them as a percent of the, the construction costs, we're down now to 22.2%, and that compares to the 2020 cost assessment, uh, where we were working our way down, sort of top down, using benchmarks within the industry and other big projects. We assumed 25.5% at that time. So we've got those numbers down from 25.5 down to 22.2. Uh, so we took the 2020 assessment, escalated it up to 2023 dollars. So that's using the United States Bureau of Reclamation construction costs trend indices. Those indices indicate 26.8% inflation between 2020 and 2023. So we took that 2020 estimate, escalated it up to 2023 dollars using USBR's recommendations. We end up at 20.17 billion. So the real key takeaway here is these are two very different estimating approaches. One taking the old numbers and just escalating them. You know, that's a pretty simplistic approach. The other was a much more detailed bottoms up approach. We came in with very similar numbers. So again, this adds a lot of confidence, indicating that, that the work done in 2020 was competent work, included sufficient allowances. Uh, the much more bottoms up and detailed approach that we now have is more reflective of the project as we understand it, but we end up in very similar numbers. The other key takeaway here is if you remove the effects of inflation on the cost, uh, they're generally flat. So you've got numbers that you sort of it were to back out the uh, 20.12 billion, roll it back to 2020 dollars, you basically end up at 15.9 billion. So uh, that's indicating the work done in 2020 and 2023 are on a good level. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question sure. about this one? Yeah. So on your 2023 assessment for uh, under other program costs, DWR oversight, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it's gone from $180 million in the 2020 assessment to $426 million uh, in the 23 assessment, is that correct? That's correct. And how will BWR spend the 426 million? What's the plan there and why did it almost triple? Sure, well first though, I guess I would say if you're gonna compare the 2023 number to the previous estimate, use the far right column. So take that 180 and escalate it over to 228. That would be the comparable number because those are both on 2023 dollar basis. So oh, then you'd be cool. looking at, yeah. So why so almost double. Right. Um, so uh, back in 2020, that was a, a really, a, you know, there was a lot of benchmarking work done to develop the soft cost. There was not a bottoms up consideration of all the labor and activities. It was more along the lines of what happens in other big projects. There's really you know, not, not quite another project that matches the conditions we have here. Um, so it was a good attempt at trying to allocate funds in, in an appropriate way. That approach uh, now is a conservative number in that, inside that gold box with the 426. And it does account for the fact that DWR's staff may be out on the site ensuring that the work being done by the DCA is consistent with how they would want state water project facilities built. Uh, I do think that that leaves an opportunity for us in the future to refine that, see if we can look for more efficient ways to ensure that we aren't sort of double booking out there in terms of the construction oversight. At this point, we don't know enough to, to not include that, so we've included it now just to make sure we've got everything covered. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions on, on this slide before I move on? Okay. Yep. So now I'm going to shift gears to a topic of innovations. And so this is focused on the design of the project. Uh, we recognize that the project design that's evaluated in the EIR is a relatively conservative design. Uh, it was started years ago through the concept design phase. We've been able to collect a fair amount of additional information. Uh, we've been able to sort of close the loop on a couple of issues that we knew were outstanding. 
a lot of the designers at the time had some really good ideas that we just really didn't have time to fully flesh out to support the environmental analysis. So we know there are opportunities to reduce impacts, reduce cost, manage schedule or risk. Uh, so we've evaluated these innovations now as an indication of how the project costs will move and, and how value engineering can be a really successful cost management strategy for the project. Uh, so we've looked at, even at this very early stage, we feel very comfortable with 19 innovations. We went through a pretty detailed screening process to consider these innovations, think about how practical and reasonable they are at this early stage. If they sort of met all of those thresholds and we were comfortable defending them as reasonable at this time, we included them. So we worked through some concept design around those innovations and have then developed uh, a second sort of secondary estimate that can help show the impacts of these innovations on the on the overall cost. And you give an example of one of those innovations? Uh, yes, right here. Yes, yes, I, yes. So this is an example. This is the new pumping plant uh, down at the South Delta. This is uh, an entirely below grade structure. So the left hand side, the more box looking structure is what's evaluated in the environmental impact report. The only thing at the surface would be those big shade structures that you see and then the, the gantry cranes toward, sort of towards the back. But the rest of that is all below grade. So there's a lot of underground construction activity associated with that pumping plant. Uh, these are large rectangular concrete box structures. So there's a, there's a lot of internal bracing required as you work your way, excavate your way down. You have to construct the intermediate floors and braces. Uh, that central piece that you see identified is the rectangular concrete wet well. So that's the inlet conduit from the tunnel shaft into the pumping plant. So that's how the water would, would enter the pumping plant. And then it would move into the adjacent rectangular concrete pump base. So that's where the 6,000 CFS worth of pumps would be. Uh, would be constructed, Those, they would straddle the, the inlet wet well and discharge into the pipelines up to the reservoir. So what we're looking at in terms of an innovation design would replace that rectangular concrete wet well with the extension of the tunnel as essentially a header pipe running into the pumping plant. So that would bring the water into the plant and then it would connect up to uh, the pump base which would be constructed in interlocking shafts as opposed to rectangular concrete structures those interlocking shafts are much faster to construct. They need overall smaller footprint. A lot less internal bracing is required, so much more efficient construction when, uh, construction time frame. So the advantages of this innovation are, are in the middle there. We've got some pretty significant quantity reductions, 274,000 cubic yards of reduced soil excavation activities, 84,000 cubic yards of reduced concrete associated with those walls that would be in the box structure. Uh, 10,400 tons of, of reduced rebar associated with the reinforcement for all those internal structures. Overall, we're able to shorten the construction of this pumping plant by almost 1,000 days, which is significant savings with respect to overhead costs, construction overhead costs. We totaled up just the direct construction cost benefits of this innovation, so this is really looking just at the quantity reductions, and it's almost $140 million. Uh, and that's all while not really changing the surface footprint at all. So that was another one of our key constraints at this point is that we really weren't making wholesale major changes to the footprint that would have uh, dramatic effects to the environmental documentation. So we took those, uh, that's an example of one of the 19 innovations. Uh, we took all of those 19 innovations, totaled up the direct construction cost benefits applied a proportion of those risk treatment costs, so only the proportion that's consistent with the reduced direct construction costs, then applied the, the contingency, uh, applied our updated labor calculations as a percent, so we used that 22.2% and rippled that through the, the updated estimate, the secondary estimate. We left everything um, from land acquisition down unchanged, so we didn't try and take any additional credit for, for additional potential reductions here that may come out of reduced land costs, et cetera. Uh, but in total, we're able, through these innovations at this early stage, reduce the estimate by 1.23 1, 1 billion or 6% of the total cost. Uh, so we think this really has a tremendous amount of opportunity and we've let a lot, we've left a lot of innovations on the table. We're not quite ready to take credit. We need to do some more work. We've got more things that we're working on now in terms of potential risk and schedule benefits, as well as uh, alternative contract delivery benefits that could also come to bear here. So I think there's quite a bit of opportunity here, and this is gonna be 
uh, an intense focus for us over the next couple of years while DWR finishes out the permit task. The idea would be that when we bring the project ultimately for consideration for implementation that we've done as much groundwork as we can to, to put forward the best possible project and, and really try and manage the effects of inflation on the, on the costs that we know are going to occur. So I'm going to hand it now over to Dr. Sungming for just a quick update on the benefit cost analysis. Before you leave, yes. I, should, I should have asked this one sure. first, but I think one of the first uh, <clears throat> slides you showed 941,000 acre feet of water savings yes. in three point some million different households. Now in, the, in the past, during the Antelope Valley, we've always considered about one acre foot you know, per household. Now this is what about less than a third of acre foot. Can you comment on that? That would be a DWR. Sure. So we, we have a resource that we use based on statewide averages. So it might not be as accurate in any specific location, but sort of for the state water project overall, it's about an average. I mean, that's what, what is it? What did you figure? I can send all, I can follow up on the exact resource. I don't have it at my fingertips, but, but we can follow up. But that's not just a middle difference. That's a great difference than what we've considered here in the Allen Valley. Okay. We'll, we'll follow up definitely. So the, you know, the 941,000 acre feet, that would have, you know, if we used one acre foot, that would be less than a, th a third of an acre foot. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the feedback. Then I had a couple of other questions and maybe it should come, it should come later, but you know, you know this in, inside and out, but maybe it'll, it'll come later in the presentation, but, but not one iota of information was given about, you know, the, you know, the affordability of this to our rate payers or taxpayers. That, and, that, you know, we're, we're, working, we're a working community, over 50 some thousand people commute to LA you know, daily. It's, it's tough economically and somebody's got to pay for this. And how is it going to help the people to live in the valley you know, right now, right there? And we have enough, we probably have enough water to double our population, AVAC probably has, or and with different water agencies, but you know we've got to look at it in a cost basis, in the benefit, and somebody's got to pay the bill. And I guess I'll ask you another question. If you should come with another speaker, let me know. But do you think this should be a vote of the taxpayers, the ratepayers, to take this obligation? Because whatever whatever you say, this cost is going to be about double that with the time you pay your interest rate. Is it thirty years or forty years? So um, I guess there's a, so there's a couple questions there, um, President Lane, and forgive me if I missed some of them. I'd be happy to, to cover them up if you feel like any haven't been, been fully addressed. Um, so first of all, in, in terms of what's within the control of the authority, uh, we will control the design and construction of the facilities, and that's really the point of the intense focus on innovations. Because you know, if you think about the, some of the challenges you're, you're describing, rightly so, in terms of affordability on the project, that's what we can affect. You know, I can really do a lot to, to put forward the best possible project. No, you're not answering at all. Well, I'll, I'll, okay, so I'll get there. So in terms of affordability, the thing that's within my control at the authority is the cost side of it, and that will translate to your ratepayer costs ultimately. Now, in terms of the business case for your agency, that will need to be performed within your agency, taking account your specific conditions and situations, your investments and, and potential cash flow issues. Uh, so that's really an augmentation of analysis that, that will be done specific to your agency. Uh, I'm here to talk about the cost. There is a discussion of statewide benefits, which is, I think, good context overall, but isn't a replacement for what will ultimately be your own agency's independent analysis and, and consideration for participation. But I can control the cost, and I want to bring to you the cheapest possible project that I can. Well, you were very good about explaining that, but not the other question. Which was the other, I'm sorry. The affordability. In you know, the state of California, it's my understanding, and, and you folks are from Sacramento, I believe, right there, but you know, when they went in five years ago, there was a, there was a surplus now there's like a $20 billion you know, deficit within this, this state and you keep passing bond issues, bond issues, and other expenses. Where is it going to end and how you have the affordability people are leaving right and left in the state? And it, how, is it, how can we afford it? How can the state afford it? Well, I think you're asking questions that are outside you know, of my control. Right. I work for you as the members of the JPA, and so you know, I'm an extension of your agency. 
uh, trying to solve some of these engineering challenges and position this project for implementation. I think in terms of, of how the project will be funded, um, you know, these, these are issues that I think are longstanding conversations regarding state water project facilities. Um, okay, thank, but, you. thank you. Yeah. I, I have one follow-up question. Mr. President? Yeah. Yeah, I have one follow-up right. question. And this may be outside your purview too, but uh, I, I understand that the plan is to bond this and, and have all those state water contractors uh, yes, hold the debt for the bond assembly finance yep. bond. Uh, is there, has there been any discussion or plans that the state of California and DWR would continue looking for uh, some type of funds from the federal government or uh, internally more state funds or there's a plan that the state water contractors will uh, do the whole thing? You know, I think um, from what I've seen, I mean, I, I think really we are looking for those opportunities um, because it would it would be beneficial to the program if we can find ways to offset some of those costs um, so there is that potential and we're exploring those um, so i guess the short answer is we're looking and has the federal side of you know they've been involved in in this this project up till now are they completely out of uh, this part of it. But I, so that's my understanding. Terry, do you want to add anything on that? Yeah. So the, the federal participants through the Central Valley Project have not used. So we provide the, the total cost of the project. We provide the cash flow of the project uh, so that then the economic analysis can actually back out the, the impacts of inflation and do an apples to apples comparison of benefits and costs. Um, so yes, it's true that uh, it, as Time passes, you know, and all the more reason to get this project done because inflation is going to take a bite out of us every year we go. Um, so while the cost will continue to inflate, so will the value of the benefits. So if nothing else changed and we just sort of revisited this same project in three years, the benefit cost analysis would stay the same. It's my hope that we can continue to sharpen our pencil on the cost side of, of the ledger and make the project more advantageous and more attractive on a cost side. Um, but it's true that nobody can stop inflation. It's, it's been a pretty serious problem. Yeah. Well, and the cost of materials, we've experienced that over the last few years. Oh yeah, it's wrapped up in that 26.8%, which, which typical, typical numbers, 35 year, 30 year rolling averages tend to hover around 3% annually. So 26.8% over the years of 2020 to 2023 is, is extreme. Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, I, this, is direct, this is Director Donato. I have a couple of questions. Um, can I ask you? Um, sure, please. First of, all, first of all, I want to go back to uh, Director Paris's comment. He asked that um, if the Fed would participate and your partner said um, there wouldn't, it wouldn't be any benefit for them. Well, I have to disagree with that because right now, that's been brought to our attention at AVAC is that I believe that China Navy base, I think that's part of the federal government, isn't it? And that's up in, and they're trying to bring water through AVAC, to AVAC, uh, from AVAC all the way up to Indian um, uh, China uh, base. And that's being worked right now. And I've heard that the feds are involved with that project. So we need to look, you need to look into that because they're, if that's the case, they're gonna be wheeling that water through the state of California table, our table A water, which will be coming from one of the sources through our pipeline system to go up north, up to the China um, base. And that's being worked on right this minute. Um, to with, with the governor, uh, I'm looking for bonding mechanisms to um, fund that, that project. That was my first my first comment. Second comment is, is this project going to be paid by the entire state of California, or is it going to be paid only by the 29 state water contractors? Okay, so on the first part, thank you for that information. What I was thinking about in the earlier comment was the Central Valley Project contractors particularly. So the federal government owns and operates the Central Valley Project. Uh, historically, for California Water Fix, they were participants in California Water Fix. 
they have not elected to participate in Delta conveyance. So that was the discussion that there's a difference between the past project and this one. But I hear you that there may be some opportunities to think about a federal involvement in a different way. And I think that that's a, a great idea that we'll look into. Uh, in terms well, of funding- well, Wait, 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 wait. Oh, I got one more comment too. You got yeah. the biggest Air Force, they've got the biggest Air Force base in the world has come to us numerous times, even through the adjudicated groundwater, that they wanted a direct federal um, distribution to Edwards Air Force Base that would be uninterruptible. Okay, so if we took this water, this, if this project's successful, we take this water and, and put it in our groundwater banking system, they would could have a proprietary right to that water going directly to the Air, um, Edwards Air Force Base that would not be, be interrupted. And again, that's a federal agency. So I think there's something not clicking here between two of the most powerful air bases in, in the world. And, and, and I'm hearing that that's not being addressed. But that's just, I mean, right now, it's not gonna be addressed tonight, I know that, but I wanna bring that to your attention uh, regarding that. Thanks, I appreciate it, that's great. great. Uh, and then, so your second question was about, about who will pay. And so, because this would be part of the state water project, we would look at this in the same way that we look at other state water project improvements. So the project would be paid for, uh, the, the DWR would issue bonds, and those bonds would be repaid by the state water contractors that are participating in the project. Uh, as Graham mentioned earlier, there is some opportunity for contractors to look for funding like through other state and federal grant programs, but that would be a, a little bit of a, an outside the box thinking. The, the, base, the base idea is that it would be funded in the same way as the other state water project improvements. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. I, 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 I do. It, it, it kind of has to do, and I think it, because the concern I get a lot is that state cost end of the estimates tend to go way up. You know, a lot of people look at the, the high speed rail started at a $33 billion estimate, now it's up five times that. Uh, and that's not due to inflation. Um, can you, is there any documentation demonstrating how the methodology to come up with these costs is different than the state used? those costs well I can speak to this estimate and the previous estimate I wasn't involved in high-speed rail or, or really other major major state infrastructure projects that um, but I, I've certainly seen the news um, I think our, our approach to this estimate the fact that we have fully developed the schedule we've thought through all the activities and built an entire what I showed you was a very simplistic version of the schedule we actually have a Primavera P6 schedule that takes us all the way from where we are now through start, you know, design, construction, startup, and commissioning of the facility with thousands of individual entries. That, that Primavera schedule is connected to the cost estimate in terms of all the activities assigned and the resources that we developed to build up. Uh, you know, this estimate includes us actually talking to vendors about material prices, current material prices. The pumps, for instance, are very expensive. We got real, uh, real world quotes from the vendors to inform the estimating process. Uh, we've included an appropriate amount of contingency in the estimate. We're following guidance from the Association for the Advancement of Cost Engineering, who really sets the bar for all of this and provides the standard operating procedures and guidelines for large agencies to, to develop cost estimates. Um, you know, well, think, that's, but that goes to my point. If it's the same standard with operating procedures that the state's used before, it, it doesn't give us a, a lot of reliability. Yeah. If, if you um, look at the potential ranges associated with, with AACE guidelines when you're dealing, you know, the, the class of estimates ranges from a class five all the way to a class one. And as you work your way through those classes, the air, you know, sort of the potential variability reduces significant. Uh, right now, many projects would, uh, you know, so the way to think about costs, especially in early stages, is it is potentially a, a band or range of costs. Um, what, I'm, what I'm providing is our opinion of the most probable cost. Based on the level of work that we've done for a class four or five estimate far exceeds what is typical for four or five estimates. If you look at the guidelines, they recommend stochastic approaches as the usual approach, which is more of a benchmarking 
kind of relationship and statistical development of cost. We've actually built through the, the schedule and the resources and the labor and the equipment to build our way up to it. Um, and when we take this estimate and roll it back to 2020 dollars to compare it with the old estimate, it's flat. It hasn't moved. So last time we had much larger allowances, larger contingency. Now we have much better detail, an appropriate level of contingency and other risk mitigations on cost. Uh, I expect continued similar performance going forward. So uh, I understand where you're coming from in terms of, of cost management. Uh, it's something I'm keenly aware of on this project. Uh, certainly don't relish comparisons to other large infrastructure that, that maybe hasn't performed as well from a cost perspective. But uh, everything I'm seeing, I feel pretty confident with the work we've done. Thank you. And, and another question, will the state want to issue these bonds without a vote of the people or it's going to be affected? I'm sorry? Would the state want issue of these bonds without a vote of the people that are going to be paying for them? Again, that's really not a decision for me to make in terms of, of state funding. Karen, do you want to comment? So because this is a state water project project, it would be funded through the state water project through DWR. So participating agencies would vote to enter the project, but it isn't a public vote, sort of like a proposition. But the state would be issuing the bonds, is that correct? The state would be issuing the bonds, but they would be state water project bonds. So they're very specific to the state water project in the same way that the other, like other improvements through the state water project are funded. So they are bonds issued by the state, but specifically repaid through the state water project. But, this, but they were exempt, now the, it was written decades ago, they're exempt from asking for the vote of the, the taxpayer or the repair. That is beyond my knowledge. I don't know that it's specific that they're exempt. It's that because this isn't a project that is funded by the general public, it is funded by the state water contractors. It's a different, it's, it's a different organizational system. Would, would either one of you have an opinion if that should be voted on by the individual water agencies, the people gonna be paying the, the cost? I. But well, the each agency would have to determine that they're going to participate, but that would typically be a, a board vote as a representative of no, the no, board. Of, this is part of a resident vote? Uh, that, is, that is not a, an opinion that I, I, I don't have an opinion on that, no. I mean, that's, that's a major part of it. I mean, it's very easy to spend this and got to be efficient, but somebody's got to pay it. Mm -hmm. And it looks like there's, when we've seen so far, there's been nil information regarding the, the affordability. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Quick question. Uh, I wasn't here in 1959 when that decision was made, but I think it's going to be similar to how the original uh, aqueduct was funded, isn't it? it wasn't, or do you? I was also it? not here in 1959. George, George, George Bain. Huh? <laughs> I, I was. Well, that, that, was, that was written. That was written. Uh, well, that was written so they could go on being in perpetuity. You know, they wrote that into the original bond. You know, you know, bond issue. It, it did come before the public and. So, so the entire aqueduct? Yeah, I think they could go on forever doing that. Okay. Yeah. Was that a good thing? No, but that's how it was sold. Understood. Great. Thank you. I knew we had an expert here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions on the cost estimate side before we get a quick economic update from Dr. Sunding? Okay, great. Dave, take it away. I'll advance the slides for you. All right, thank you, Graham, and good to be with everyone. I wish we could be together in person, but uh, great to be with you by video. Um, so we've been working uh, for about the last 18 months, uh, my team and I, on an economic analysis of the DCP. And what we're doing in the economic analysis, it's also called a benefit cost analysis, and that is just what it sounds like. It's an attempt to look at what are various categories of costs of the project, and put it side by side with an assessment of the value of the benefits. And the goal of doing a cost benefit analysis, which is required at the federal level uh, for really about the business case for the project. So we've been looking at the, the benefit cost analysis for the Delta Conveyance Project um, at a statewide level. And I'm gonna echo a comment that I think it was Graham that made it earlier. The intent of this benefit cost analysis is to provide some statewide planning level information about the impacts of the project, positive and negative, 
But each agency, as it decides whether or not to participate going forward, is going to have to do its own analysis using details and context and models that are really more than what we can put into a statewide, uh, statewide kind of a study that covers the range of agencies that are receiving water from the state water project system. So we have, I think, valuable information about the effects of the project and what might be the benefits economically. But ultimately, again, every agency is going to have to think about the impacts and whether or not it's worth it to the ratepayers. So just a tiny bit of context, state water project looking again statewide, uh, serves about 27 million people. The gross domestic product of the state water project service area is about $2.8 trillion, which would be the world's eighth largest economy if it were a country in its own right. Currently, the state water project is delivering about 2.56 million acre feet per year. That's on average. And that's, of course, to a, a mix of urban and agricultural customers. Now, in terms of the, the the effects of the DCP on the state water project, what we focused on in the economic study is really two sets of future challenges. Um, first is climate change and sea level rise, which are expected to reduce deliveries by almost a quarter, uh, just out to 2070 and potentially more than that uh, beyond 2070. Um, and another future challenge that we looked at in the economic study is the risk of an extended uh, service disruption and also a quality disruption following a major seismic event. So, Graham, you can go ahead and advance. Um, the, the benefit cost analysis, our attempt was to look at a variety of benefits of the DCP and a variety of costs. On the benefit side of the ledger, we looked at the effects of the DCP on state water project deliveries, in particular reliability and quality, and the ability of the DCP to offset the negative impacts of anticipated climate change. We also looked at the ability of the DCP to maintain deliveries after a large earthquake, uh, particularly a couple of faults uh, just to the west of the delta. On the cost side of the ledger, we used exactly the cost estimates that Graham just went through for uh, construction costs, but those also include uh, the Community Benefit Fund and almost a billion dollars in environmental mitigation. In addition to that, we looked at O&M costs for a 100-year operating life for the project. And then we also calculated the economic value of some negative environmental impacts in the delta that are unmitigated, primarily during the construction period, but also a few, water quality in particular, that relate to operation of the project. Overall, our conclusion is that, again, from a statewide point of view, um, aggregate benefits uh, well exceed costs from the project. And from a ratepayer point of view, for every dollar spent on the project, ratepayers get about $2.20 in benefits. And you can go to the next slide. Um, if there is one slide that I, could, uh, that I could encourage you to take away from this short presentation, it would be this one. And think about the consequences on your own agency as you make decisions about whether or not to participate in the project. Um, I'll walk you through this left to right, and the first column is showing a level of deliveries on the state water project with the current infrastructure and more or less current hydrologic and climate conditions. So again, that's the 2.56 million acre feet of average deliveries on the state water project. Now by 2070, so if we look at 27, excuse me, 2070 hydrologic and climate conditions, but with the current infrastructure, so if we just let climate change happen with sea level rise and didn't make any changes to current infrastructure in the delta, then it's expected that delta deliveries would drop by about 570,000 acre feet to just under 2 million acre feet. So that's, that's about the quarter of lost uh, water supplies that would result from climate change. And again, that's only out to 2070. That's 25 years into the operating life of the project that we assumed. 
If we went out to 2100, there's very good reason to believe that the impacts would be even larger than this. But the modeling we have available that's in the EIR and accompanying documents goes out to 2070. So then the last two columns, what we're doing there is under future climate conditions, isolating the water supply benefits of the DCP. So there we take 2070 climate and sea level rise and look at what happens to deliveries if we add in the DCP. And you can see that the DCP increases future deliveries by about 403,000 acre feet. So it doesn't go all the way back to mitigating uh, the effects of climate change and sea level rise. So there is still somewhat of a drop, but it restores about two thirds of what's lost uh, due to climate change. So that's the primary benefit of the project. I think it is accurate to think about the DCP as a, as a climate mitigation effort. Uh, we looked at a whole range of benefits, though, uh, related to, say, water quality impacts and, again, the seismic reliability impacts. The, with the DCP in place, there's much less disruption to water supplies following a major earthquake. In our main scenario that we follow throughout the study, uh, we get a benefit cost ratio of about 2.2 to 1. But there is uncertainty about exactly how the climate's going to evolve in the future and other things. So we dealt with that the way one normally does, and we did our benefit cost analysis under a whole range of future conditions to see how robust the results are. And for example, if you look at scenario two, there we're using the same 2070 hydrology, but assuming Instead of 1.8 feet of sea level rise, we assume three and a half feet of sea level rise. Probably not surprisingly, the benefit cost ratio is even better in that case. More sea level rise means more reduction in uh, delta exports for about the same cost. And so the benefits are, are higher relative to the cost in that case. But just to look at kind of an extreme case, we looked at the performance of the project economically if the climate didn't evolve at all beyond when the DCP begins operating. So we assumed in the last two scenarios, 2040 conditions throughout the 100 year assumed operating life of the project. And even in that case, which is not realistic, but we wanted to test this under extreme assumptions, even in that case, the project passes a benefit cost test. So just the last thing I would leave you with, and I'm, I'm very mindful of concerns about affordability. I hear that a lot, and I certainly know, uh, you know, understand how water rates have increased throughout the state, but especially in Southern California um, in the recent past. We did a similar analysis of the water fix project, and, you know, there are some important differences in what we were doing there. But if you look at water rates, say at Metropolitan Water District, between when we did the water fix study and now when we're doing the DCP study, water rates are about 70% higher now than they were even just that recently. Um, so I'm very mindful of questions about affordability. And one way of interpreting our results is that, yes, the DCP is expensive, but doing nothing to many agencies, and you'll have to think about whether this is true for AVEC, doing nothing can be substantially more expensive. Maintaining the status quo in the Delta is not possible. One way or another, something's going to change. Investing in the DCP is one way for it to change. Not investing in the DCP and letting climate change take its toll, that's another way of changing it not doing the DCP and investing in more expensive water supply alternatives is another way of changing. And again, one way of interpreting our results is to understand that the cost of doing nothing, the cost of not doing the DCP is in many ways uh, more than the cost of investment in the DCP. So again, with with no investment in the DCP, climate change is expected to erode deliveries by almost a quarter by 2070. So think about, you know, as you do your agency level analysis, which I know staff is doing now, 
think about how would AVEC respond to losing a quarter of state water project deliveries? What would your what would your alternatives be in that case? And for many agencies, we we looked at a whole range of state water contractors. Losing that magnitude of water supply would result in some significant direct impacts, reduced reliability and flexibility on state water project operations, water shortages, more frequent and more severe instances of mandatory rationing, an ongoing unaddressed risk of major seismic disruption, and potentially investment in water supply alternatives that are generally more expensive on a per acre foot basis than the DCP. And those direct impacts have their own indirect impacts that we also looked at in the report in the form of higher rates for local agencies, uh, impacts on employment and economic activity, particularly in communities that are agriculture dependent, uh, like in the San Joaquin Valley, potential for higher food prices, and importantly, um, certainly ABEC understands this as well as anyone, maintenance of surface water deliveries is compatible with the statewide objective to stabilize groundwater resources. Uh, so that's something we're mindful of as well. So again, another way of interpreting our results is that the cost of inaction on climate and seismic risk uh, exceeds the $38 billion in project benefits that we're calculating. You know, having a cost-benefit ratio that just clears one, that's probably not enough. You want to build in a cushion there so that if you did have a significant increase in cost down the line, that you would not look back on the project and wish you hadn't done it. And if you're in a cost-benefit ratio anywhere in the range where we are here of above two, uh, two to one in our main scenario, with the kind of contingencies built into the cost estimate that that Graham described, um, I think that's a pretty pretty comfortable place to be. What are you thinking? In Mr. Pierce. Excuse me. Um, I just wanted to follow up on Drew's question. If the cost of this project doubles then for your main scenario, is the cost benefit 1.1? It, it would be right. It would go, well, 1.2. 1. Uh, 1. 1.2. 1. 1.2. And then if it tripled, it would be less than 1. It would be in the 1 half or something. It, yes. It, it depends, though, how the costs increase. If it's something like inflation, as Graham mentioned before, inflation also affects the benefits. Right, so if, if it's just a matter of like a general increase in, in prices, then everything would go up and the ratio would be relatively unaffected. Yep. And, and I think you realize, all of you realize that this is probably going to be the biggest decision for our taxpayers that this board has ever made. And so we're going to ask tough questions. We're going to be looking at all the facts. And if we don't, we're not doing our job. So, absolutely, um, no, no question. And again, I want to be very mindful of the fact that, you know, what we're doing in this study is we're looking at agencies all the way from San Diego up to Santa Clara, and then the ag contractors in between. So, in an analysis that covers that many agencies. We can't include every detail and every consideration, every operational fact that an individual agency can and should take, uh, take account of. So again, what we're trying to do is provide a statewide look, a planning level analysis at benefits and costs, but then each individual agency is going to need to look at this carefully through whatever models they use. Um, most agencies that I've talked to have found things in the study that are that are useful. You know, some categories of benefits or the way that we're thinking about timing and discounting and and incremental water supplies, kind of a useful description of what the project accomplishes. But ultimately again, you and your staff are gonna to have to look at all the details that are relevant to you and make your own decision. You know, take this as an input, but make your decision. Yeah, and I, I, I think all of us, 
want to thank you for all the information you're giving us. It's information we desperately need. And, you know, we know what your job is and, and you're, you're doing your job really well. Uh, so if we appear anxious or our questions appear biting, it's because we're looking at a major, major decision for all our taxpayers. So, and I think you guys realize that. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, uh, Dave, I'll just interject. You know, I spent some time talking about the innovations back in the cost estimate side. Uh, we provided that cash flow also to the economics team. They performed the benefit cost analysis of, of that project, the $18.9 billion project. I think, Dave, if I'm remembering correctly, the benefit cost ratio is around 2.3, 2.32. That's right. And, and that's also in the economic report. Um, so I really do think that the value engineering cost management side of this is going to play out in, in really important ways, uh, ensuring that that we aren't getting too ahead of ourselves and trying to take credit for things that are not reasonable to the point that we got to come back and say, oh, we went a little too far. You know, we counted some things that weren't quite ready yet. So we've been pretty conservative, but still see some some pretty good opportunities. I know we've left some good opportunities on the table that we're going to keep analyzing. Yeah, I had one question from the doctor. Just about so many of the assumptions you've made, you know, we don't know if they're going to happen or not. They're just assumptions. And we've got that cost benefit ratio to our taxpayers, to our ratepayers across this, you know, down the street, how do we how do we justify this large increase in cost for a, a benefit? How do they receive that in you know, a benefit in the next five or ten years? Yeah, that that is a great question, and I'll tell you, you know, working on a lot of climate mitigation projects of different kinds in my in my job, it comes up a lot. And it's something that's really difficult about climate change and climate change mitigation is you're talking about spending real money now, you know, in this case, $20 billion for a project that won't even begin operating until 2045. And then, you know, our assumption is a hundred year operating life beyond that. So we're talking about benefits that would be received by people who may not even be alive yet. And that, that is an especially difficult kind of decision to make. And I think this agency is not the only one um, that, that is grappling with that. It's a really common issue with any kind of a climate mitigation project, whether it's DCP or a seawall, benefits are gonna be very far into the future. But the, the consequences of not doing something um, are also pretty dramatic and you know, even even with discounting the future, with counting it less than than current dollars, which we do in this analysis, um, you know, it looks to us like the the value of the reduced shortages that come from not losing that quarter of state water project deliveries is worth the upfront costs. But I I am very mindful of the fact that you've got to look far into the future. Um, to understand the true value of this project. Yeah, thank you. We have another question, Dr. Miller. Yeah, for the doctor, um, I'm trying to understand on the climate change issue, if the sea level rises, it, I know the Delta Bay area is working on solutions there, but um, normally more water is put down the river in order to keep the brackish water back, right? So you're talking three and a half foot influx, right? How much extra water is going to have to go down the river that's not going to go in the Delta Conveyance Project that won't come to us? Right. So yeah. Uh, but, oh, yeah, sorry. Carrie, go I can I can get that started. So the input for the economic evaluation comes from the evaluations needed to support the EIR. So a lot of this work is is work that that I helped with, which is why I'll jump in. Um, it's it's true. So when we have sea level rise, what happens is that we have to release more water from storage, typically, in order to keep the salinity further out and have the the bay delta uh, function in the same way that it does now. And so that does mean that we have these pretty substantial changes in the yield of the state water project absent a Delta conveyance project. But that, that sort of drives the need for us to do something a little differently. 
even in these future conditions, we do expect that we will still have these splashy storm events where we have very high flows. We're also going to have more rain instead of snow. And so what those two things really indicate is that we need to be able to capture water when it's available to combat that concern about releasing additional water from storage in order to keep the salinity um, out of the delta. Yeah, it, it would be nice to know what some of those solutions are for that because we, we've been disappointed. And, and this, this year especially, um, if, if the conveyance project is in effect, we're supposed to be able to get, not worry about the fish and other things. Um, so I, I think it's, for me, having the confidence in the project to know that it will actually send water down to us when we need it. And then for the seismic, we're on the San Andreas Fault. If you have an earthquake, we'll probably have an earthquake. And we, in the meantime, we still have to keep up the original project, which is going to cost money. And how, do you remember how long we have a life of that canal? Of that I can't recall. It's less than 100 years. It's less, yes. Yeah, maybe math knows. Yeah. Right? So you might have a 100-year project for the conveyance project, but we have less than that in our aqueduct. And we'll still have to put in funds to keep that up and pray that no seismic event happens. <laughs> is there any further questions from the board? Well, I would just offer one one response, Director Miller. I mean, one, one of the key differences is, is the challenge of the Delta, if there's a seismic failure, the ability to repair that and flush out the salt water is so much more challenging and difficult than dealing with a breach along the aqueduct. That's a surface facility. You deal with that pretty quick. That's bypass. You're back in action. There's not that sort of quick back in action approach, and that's what the tunnel okay. provides. Yeah, thank you. You all done a very good job. Is there anyone listening in who would like to address our speakers? Feel free to do so. Okay, it's like an auction going, going, gone. <laughs> yeah, thank you much. Thank you All very right. much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank but you. I just want to, for Carrie and Graham and, and Dave, you fantastic information. You've done a great job presenting, and I appreciate you putting up with us. It's just <laughs> a tough, tough work. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to be moving on to the Finance Committee. We've got a couple of items on that, and uh, Director Donato is chairman of that, so we'll turn it over to Director Donato. Okay, um, let's talk about item um, AP1, uh, consider a possible action to accept and file the check registry list for the period of May 30th through June 12th. And uh, our general manager, Matt, is going to go over that. All right. Thank you, Vice President Donato. So on page uh, 11 is the first page of our checklist for that period. And uh, on the first page, item number one is our monthly fixed cost payment to DWR. All of the, the repairs have been completed now on the West Feeder. So that uh, facility is, is able to flow water again. Right now it's offline, but if we need it, it's uh, ready to go. Uh, also, we went through the High Desert Water Bank capital cost um, that's reimbursed by Metropolitan. It's on page 16. And uh, President Lane has some good suggestions that we're going to add to a future High Desert Water Bank item that's to show percent of work completed versus percent of payout today or on the contract. So those were good suggestions and, and we'll add that next month. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, but this, we went through this in detail with the finance committee last week. Okay, if there's no further um, comments or questions um, on that. Um, okay, I'll move on. I move on to order to accept uh, AP1. The motion by Director Donato. Do we have a second? Second. Director Mercy, second. Now, Madam Secretary, we get a roll call. Gary Van Dam? Yes. Audrey Miller? Yes. Robert Harris? Yes. Keith Dias? Yes. Drew Mercy? Yes. Frank Donato? Yes. 
George Lane. Yes, motion carried. Yeah, thank you. And it brings us to 8B2. Uh, consider consider possible action to accept and file the uh, treasurer's report for the period ending May 31st, um, 2024. And our finance manager, Teresa Yates, is going to help um, explain what's going on there. Thank you, Director Donato. Good evening, directors. Uh, page 20 of your agenda packet is the portfolio summary. And the yield to maturity for the total portfolio for May was 4.642%, which was up 0.053% from April. And average days to maturity for the total portfolio was 224 days or approximately seven months. And total cash and investments at May 31st was 140 million, which was down three and a half million from April um, due to the uh, bond payments that were made during May. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Teresa, it's done, it's very, done very nice. It's easy to follow. You Thank do a good you. job. Thanks. As long as you make money. <laughs> hey, I can't control the rates. <laughs> I hope my job doesn't depend on the rates. <laughs> Uh, this is is director, I'm, I'm on order, order 8B2. Second. This is Keith. Okay, we have a motion to second. Dr. Donato, Dr. Dias. There's no further questions. Madam Secretary, we're going to have a roll call. Gary Van Dam? Yes. Audrey Miller? Yes. Robert Harris? Yes. Keith Dias? Yes. Drew Mercy? Yes. Frank Donato? Yes. George Lane? Yes. Motion carried. That concludes my report. Okay, thank you, Director Donato. Okay, we'll move on to um, Water Projects Committee and Chairman is Audrey Miller, Director Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to yield to our General Manager, Matt. All right, thank you, Director Miller. And, and I'm gonna yield to Executive Assistant Pam Clark hmm. uh, as she's she's been doing a lion's share of the work on this item. So she's got a few slides to present this evening. Uh, we went through this with the uh, Water Projects Committee a few weeks back. So take it away, Pam. Thanks, Matt. Good evening, directors. Um, on page 34, you'll find a staff report for this item. And I'll provide a little background. Um, so back in May of 2023, AVEC was awarded $625,000 in grant funding uh, from the Department of Water Resources. And that was through the Prop 1, Round 2, uh, Fremont Basin IRWM grant program. And that was to replace the Mojave Pump Station metal, uh, metal building uh, with a new block building. Uh, ABEC signed a grant agreement with DWR back in October of last year. And then staff began working on a project design concept, uh, issued an RFP for design, received proposals, and then presented those proposals to the Special Water Projects Committee in March of this year. And during that time, um, multiple leaks have been occurring on ABEC's West Feeder Pipeline in a very isolated four mile section of the pipeline. And the committee felt that that might be a higher priority project and asked staff to inquire if it was possible to repurpose grant funding uh, from the Mojave pump station for a higher priority project like the West Feeder. So at the direction of the committee, staff reached out to DWR um, to inquire on that process for repurposing grant funds and learn that AVEC would need to have another qualifying project um, submit a new grant application and complete an uh, amendment to the existing agreement. And staff work with DWR staff to develop a new uh, grant application package um, and submitted that as a draft um, for like a preliminary review. Um, and staff at DWR did determine that um, the West Feeder project could be a replacement project for the Mojave pump station. Um, one of the questions the committee had was if um, if we repurpose the funds, if we could also use any remaining funds to uh, do upgrades to the existing Mojave pump station, um, we did learn that we cannot do that. Um, the reason for that is the grant requires the project to be new construction, um, cannot be used for any repairs, um, upgrades, that type of work. Um, the reason the West Feeder is seen as new construction is because we would actually be removing sections of the pipe and replacing it with new pipe, so they look at that as new construction. Um, and then there's also an inspection plan for the West Feeder uh, to, to determine if additional work is going to be needed on that project. 
So the next step, if we want to move forward, is to have a resolution approved um, by the board. Um, that would have to be submitted with a um, final application. Um, the amendment process would take about three months, give or take, maybe a little bit longer. And then if that amendment gets completed, Ava can seek reimbursement for any past work that was done on the West Peter project um, that occurred during the open grant period. So there have been, um, I think, three repairs already completed um, for a total of about $420,000. So we get reimbursement on that. And then the remaining 200 some thousand dollars, if there's any future repairs um, during the grant period on the West Peter, we can get reimbursed for those. Um, we are working to try to amend the grant period. Right now it is extended through uh, September of this year. Uh, we could potentially add about six months to that. So that give us a little more window and cushion for being able to use the rest of that funding if the um, inspection occurs and there's more uh, repairs that are needed. And then we're also working on a letter um, that is needs to be signed by the regional water management group stakeholders. Um, we've distributed that. Um, it would have to approve this project be um, the grant funding stay in the region and be uh, redistributed to the West Feeder. Um, I don't see that we'd have any problem with that. It might just take a little bit of time. Um, and that's all I have unless there's any other questions. The amendment is not approved. Do we get to still use the funds for the original purpose? We would have to ask for a time extension. Um, I would say there's maybe no guarantee on that, but I'd say it's highly likely we could go back and ask for the grant period to be extended so that we could go back and um, re-add the Mojave pump station back into the project. Are we concerned with the present state of the state budget that if we do this and it's not approved that the state would take these funds back? Sure. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I suppose that's a potential risk the board would have to look at. I mean, right now there's grant funding that was secured for the initial project. Um, you know, they feel we should be able to repurpose the funding, but I'm not sure if there's a potential for the whole project, uh, the whole program to go away. I'm sure that's, that's a potential. And if we don't do this amendment and go forward and do the repairs to the Mojave pump station, we can get that, we can do that and get that funding before the deadline. We'd have to do the actual Mojave pump station building. Yeah, no, I understand Yeah, that. yeah, the new construction. Yeah, what would are, happen? Are we prepared, and this may not be you, your expertise, I'm sure there's somebody there sure there's that somebody it is. Um, are we prepared and do we have the plans to complete the repairs of the Mojave pump station if we decided not to do this amendment? No, no we, we have not completed the design of that. So we still have to do the design, put out to bid, and do the construction work. Can we do that before the deadline? Probably not. We would need no. an extension. extension. Yeah. yeah. We'd, Probably we'd a six-month extension. We'd have to ask for an amendment, and if that was to get granted, we'd be able to extend the period. And if I could just add, you know, one reason why this was brought up by the committee, looking at the, the Mojave pump station, structurally the, the building is sound. It's not like it's falling apart. It just does need some improvements, but the structure is in good shape there. So that's why we, we kind of reshifted focus away from the pump station. I mean, there's things we could do with – um, they cost much less than the $620,000 to the Mojave pump station to get it up to snuff. So could our amendment be to defray the cost of the repairs that we've already had and the rest of it, and the rest of it goes to do the repairs of the Mojave pump station no, no, it's, Why is that? it has to be a new construction project. Uh, yeah. So if it, it cannot be repair work. Now, of course, the West Feeder is, it needs what be considered a repair, but that's looked at as new construction because we're installing new pipe. new pipe. But if we're just upgrading a building, that doesn't fall into the grant requirement. Okay. So that's kind of how we're able to work in the West Feeder project. Okay. Also, we don't know what else may happen to the West Feeder. Right. I, I am just concerned with the yeah. state yeah. budget already having the grant funds, and if it goes away, that's six hundred and some thousand dollars we we will not be using. That's my only. Well, let's let's ask uh, Madam Portion. 
Of that six hundred some thousand dollars, is that from the general fund or is that from some of these bond issues? No, it's from the bond issues. So it's not no, going to go away. It's not going to go. Yeah, that's my understanding. Because no. I, I, Peter and I asked the same sure. question on the Prop One funding under the um, uh, Water Commission, yes, and because um, that was our fear too that that hundred and some odd million was going to go away with budget problems the state's having, and the answer was, like Director Lane mentioned, because it's bond issue money that money set already set aside so okay. great not thank you. thank you very much okay uh, is there any questions or comments ma'am good, good job yeah good job ma'am so we'll, thank you we have a motion on order word order 8c1 for the dub resolution Yes, motion carried. All right. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. We'll move on to item number D, Executive Committee. That's regarding um, um, a new statement of work and cost um, for Edwards Air Force Base and staff negotiated uh, most all of that. So we're going to, and with, they did talk to the Executive Committee, but uh, Matt, if you could go with that, please. All right. Thank you, President Lane. So as uh, President Lee mentioned, we reviewed this item with the executive committee. Um, we thought that was a good fit just because, because the three members on that committee had the history with, with the original contract with Edwards Air Force Base. So they had a lot of the background. So we want to make sure we weren't missing anything as we were going through this. So in your board packet on page 37 is a staff report. And attached to the staff report is the statement of work for the wholesale water supply uh, for Edwards Air Force Base. And that's what we would be considering approval of this evening. So just a little background on the screen. You can see um, some bullet points. Edwards, a little history for those directors that haven't been around this. Um, Edwards being a federal facility does not pay uh, property tax that go towards AVAC uh, or their share of the state water project cost. Um, AVAC and Edwards developed a take or pay contract years ago um, for 100 acre, 180 acre feet per month or 2,160 acre feet per year under a take or pay. Their, their current um, all in rate, which is the commodity rate plus the the missed out state water project taxes is about $1,529 per acre foot. They've historically delivered about, uh, or we've delivered about 1,500 acre feet per year to Edwards. Their annual payments is uh, right at about $3.2 million total. So we, staff was uh, contacted by Edwards rate consultant that was hired to review all of their utility rates for the base. And it sounds like they're doing this at all of the, the bases nationwide. Uh, periodically, they, they hire consultants to review utility rates and water supply is one of them. Uh, the consultant was very cooperative with staff and, and really stated that they just were hired to justify the, the rate that Edwards is paying and make sure they're they're paying their fair share and they're not being supplemented by the taxpayers here in the valley or vice versa. Um, Edwards request, re request to pay the same variable rate as other AVAC customers. You know, that's the $752 per acre foot plus their share of the state work project contract. Um, their, their existing contract was very complicated and and the executive committee acknowledged that. And we worked closely with Raptelis, uh, Teresa Yates and Justin Lipsey did a good job on this. And they came up with a very 
straightforward, fair uh, rate that's easy to calculate each year, easy for Edwards to understand, and uh, is really net revenue neutral for the agency. Um, so we, we accomplish what Edwards is requesting, and that's both a fixed and variable component in their rate. We ensure Edwards pays their share of the state water project cost, no matter how much water they use. And that this is the take or pay portion. So even if their water uh, use goes way down, they still pay their share of the state water project cost. Uh, keeps the monthly take or pay associated with the state water project. And then Edwards would also pay a variable rate that's consistent with all AVEC customers based, based on the actual deliveries to the base. AVEC's annual revenue from Edwards is consistent with the current contract. And oh, that must be the last one. So in your packet, I mentioned the statement of work. And the last page of that, which is page 49 of your packet, shows the example of the rate calculation. So there you can see it's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. They're, they're paying 180 acre feet per month on a take or pay that um, ensures their percentage of the state water project contract cost. And then they also play, pay a variable rate, uh, which is roughly 1,500 acre feet per year at currently at $752 per acre foot. So as I mentioned, the, the net revenue, uh, annual revenue is pretty consistent, uh, just slightly more than what it currently is. So with that, we're seeking approval for uh, the attached statement of work with Edwards. Okay, is there any uh, questions or comments? Yeah, I had one question. Uh, doesn't Edwards have a production right? With a water master, seven hundred acre feet. Um, it's actually about seven thousand. I'm think. sorry. 7, yes, seventy six hundred. Okay. Yeah, they Edwards does have a production right. Um, they don't. Whatever they don't pump each year, uh, in the judgment, the the balance gets allocated amongst the public water suppliers, like LA County Water Works, Palmdale Water District, Quartz Hill, etc. Right. So. So are they? going to pump that first and then use this water? Or? So they do pump some. I think they pump a thousand acre feet roughly currently and they'll probably continue to pump a portion of the production right. But they they supplement their water with AVAC water. Thank you. Yep. Staff did do a lot of work on this so good job. Yeah. Shout out to Teresa Yates and Justin Livesey. They worked hard on this. Yeah, no, no, I can, we can see that and appreciate it. Uh, so if there's no further questions or comments, we've got uh, Order for 8C1, Adopt Resolution R24-08. And so, Madam, Madam Secretary? I need a motion in there. I'll, I'll move approval. Second. Okay. We have a motion and second. Uh, Madam Secretary? Gary Van Dam? Yes. Audrey Miller? Yes. Robert Paris? Yes. Keith Dias? Yes. Drew Mercy? Yes. Frank Donato? Yes. George Lane? Yes. Motion carried. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. And then we'll uh, move us on to the next item, item um, AE1 uh, um, Watermaster. And Rob, that's your turn that over to you. Victor Paris. And I'll turn that over to Matt, who may turn that over. No, not to you. <laughs> I'd like to, but I don't. So, yes, we decided not to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Director Paris. So uh, we went through this with the Watermaster Committee last Friday. And uh, this is in preparation of the Watermaster meeting tomorrow. And this board, this board to give direction to uh, our representative, Rob Paris. Uh, for tomorrow's meeting. So, Angel, help me with a few slides here to somewhat get the highlights of what's on the agenda tomorrow. Uh, first item, it's not on the screen, but uh, the Watermaster is going to consider the 2023 annual financial audit tomorrow. And just note, it is a clean audit. So, there'll be a presentation from the audit firm tomorrow on that. Um, 
you know, this has gone very smooth this year as opposed to the prior year. So Thank you, Teresa. <laughs> a lot of that has to do with Teresa. Yeah. Good job. Um, and then the next item is going to be an update or consideration of possible action on selection of RFQ respondents. So a little background. Uh, the Watermaster put out an RFQ in early May for admin services for the Antelope Valley Watermaster. The deadline was June 7th, and the Watermaster received uh, two proposals or statement of qualifications. Um, one from Provost and Pritchard, and the other one from RGS, which is Regional Government Services. So the process that we, the Watermaster developed was uh, first we would seek qualifications through a statement of qualifications, uh, which we've received those, following the, in, um, and then uh, request the chosen ones to come and have a public interview with the watermaster. Following the interview with the watermaster, uh, they would select a respondent to receive a, a request for a proposal. Then this, this gets into the details of the scope of work and the fee that they would charge the watermaster to perform. So tomorrow we're just considering the two that we received and hopefully the watermaster chooses to invite both of these. Uh, for an interview. Here's a quick summary of the two that we received uh, statement qualifications for. I mentioned Provost and Pritchard on the left, RGS on the right. Um, just a little background, you, you can read their, what they submitted there, but um, Provost and Pritchard is the firm that Dan Flory, the prior G general manager for AVAC, uh, went to go work for. He's still working there at Provost and Pritchard. RGS is the uh, the group that proposed last time that the Watermaster went out with an RFP. Um, they're kind of a, made up of various government agencies, um, and they have a, they propose a, a lady that lives in Victorville as well as a uh, board secretary that I believe she lives in uh, Ridgecrest. So they're kind of from various locations. And um, those are the two that submitted proposals. This was reviewed by the advisory committee on last Wednesday. The advisory committee, a couple members wanted to extend the deadline uh, for receiving proposals for by a couple weeks. Um, my recommendation to this board to give direction to Paris is to not extend it. Um, I don't feel that that would be fair to the two people that did respond in time um, and kind of gives anybody else a, a little bit of an upper hand to see who their competition is. So I would recommend not extending the deadline and proceed with interviewing these two. Yeah, we had a committee meeting, and I think the consensus was we strongly agree with that also, that we should not be extending the deadline under any circumstances. We can always go through this process, and if, if we don't like either of these, then we could put it out to bid again. Okay, you know, you know, thank you. Was there any questions or comments? Now I've got a couple more slides. So that's one item. Um, then there, another item is to get into uh, conditions that were approved and the applicants failed to submit their annual production report for various reasons. But um, in the rules it says if you don't submit your annual production report that you get assessed the full new production amount that you were approved for. So Watermaster did that, invoiced these folks. They came to the last Watermaster meeting and. I asked for forgiveness on that. Um, it got tabled till uh, tomorrow's meeting. And looking into the details a little bit, it, it looks like most of those that were assessed either don't have wells drilled yet um, or have them drilled and not equipped. So I'm speaking from my point of view as AVAC staff. Um, 
I, I don't think it's appropriate, if, especially if they haven't drilled the well or haven't equipped the well, that they should be assessed the production right. Now, if they've been pumping water and failed to produce the production report, then absolutely they should be held to the rules. But I think there should be some uh, leniency, especially if they have not drilled the well or equipped the well. So those are my thoughts. And again, the committee met, and our consensus was we strongly agree with what Matt just told you. Um, I, I just add, I think at the last meeting we gave several of them the chance to go back and re-actually submit the correct reports, and if they did so, I think we're going to take a look at them at this meeting and make a decision um, depending on the equity of yeah. Charging them. Rob, is that committee the Water Master Committee? It's the AVAC Water Master Committee. Oh. So when I talk about us meeting it, it's our committee exactly. before uh, we do a report or map as the report so we can reach consensus within the committee so we can let you know. Right. Yeah, I agree with uh, Matt and yourself on that. Um, I don't see how you can charge them for. If they're not capable of even pumping water yet, how do you can penalize them? Good job. Did I get all that right, Angel? Anything to add? No. No. Okay. And then lastly, uh, we have some applications to review tomorrow. We have uh, one new production application for a single family home, 1.5 acre feet per year. Uh, the advisory committee did recommend approval of this item have three transfers. The first one is between the 50th District Agricultural Association, which is the fairgrounds, and the City of Lancaster for 32 acre feet per year of permanent production right. Uh, the advisory committee um, voted 11-0 to table this item, uh, pending some additional information. So I think we on this item, I think we go along with the advisory committee's recommendation and, and see what information comes next month. Uh, and then uh, there's from the AV mobile home or mobile estates to the AV mobile home park, 8.75 acre feet of production rights. Um, committee recommended approval of this item. And then a uh, temporary one-time transfer from Pamela Godey to Robertson Ready Mix of 150 acre feet. And the committee also approved that item. Uh, lastly, we have a new point of extraction. Um, they are a known small pumper. And uh, the existing well is inoperable. And this new well will be used to maintain existing structure on the property. Uh, the committee reviewed this and is recommending approval of that. Any questions on any of those? Seems pretty straightforward. And we have, do we have consensus for uh, Director Fair? Yeah, I think everybody's on the same page, so unless we hear otherwise, I don't think we need a, mo a motion. Uh, Are you okay with that? Yes, I, I feel the consensus. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry, I got one more slide. Uh, this is uh, consideration possible action on Todd Brownwater's budget and scope for the next three years, 2025 through 2027. Um, this was tabled from the May meeting. Um, I don't remember why it was tabled, but it was tabled. And uh, down at the bottom there, you can see the last three years, their contract from 2022 through 2024 was right around $220,000 each year. Um, the proposed amendment, which would cover, as I mentioned, next three years, is right at $200,000 a year. So it's come down a little bit. Part of that reduction is due to um, having the, the model updated and completed. So that model work was included in the previous amendment. Um, the advisory committee reviewed this item and they recommend approval of the three-year base contract, but did not want to proceed with the optional task in the 2025 contract. That was about a $29,000 optional task to develop a, 
application that can be on a smartphone, an iPad, etc., for parties or producers to upload their production information rather than submitting a printed form that they fill out, scan, fax, email, etc., to the watermaster. So AVAC committee discussed this last week, and AVAC committee um, recommends the same uh, approval of the 25 through 2027 base contract, but doesn't want to just forego the optional task at this point. Is going to request the water master engineer provide some more information to show the cost benefit ratio um, of doing the optional task. Because even though it's a $29,000 hit next year, maybe it shows savings over the next you know three to five years. So I think uh, our committee wants to request that additional information from the engineer. So, yeah. And I think we're going to uh, see if we can hire uh, Dr. Dave Sunday to do the cost <laughs> benefit analysis. <laughs> My guess is we'd spend more than 29000 on that. <laughs> so I think... Oh, okay, uh, you know, thank you. Does that uh, conclude the report? That concludes our report. I have the consensus. Thank you very much. Good, good job, Matt. Okay, right. you, know, you know, thank you. Thank you. And um, going down the agenda, item number nine, general manager's report, water supply and projects and programs. Uh, Mass back to you. Yep, and I'm going to pass 